you so much for coming today. On that state, I'm the chair of the Department of Psychiatry, to say the current chair of the Department of Psychiatry. Um, uh, I have the, the great pleasure of being able to introduce uh, both of our speakers today. So um, uh, I have to say it's on days like today that um, I uh, regret how often I use words like remarkable, outstanding, and world class. <laughs> Truly, this afternoon is um, um, I'm going to need. I'm going to need them to carry their full meeting. I have a hyperbole problem this afternoon that I, I, I fear is not going to get any better as the day goes on. Um, but the truth is that we're here today to celebrate someone who's had a lasting impact not only on UCSF, but helped to create a new scientific field in the early stages of his career, and has really helped to lay the foundation for the understanding of the biological basis of mental illness. So <clears throat> our, our program today, in a few minutes, you'll get to hear from Sam, and then you'll hear from our invited speaker, uh, Dr. Geiseroff. Um, I'll tell you just a bit about his history. I think many of you know that he's a Brooklyn boy, um, and uh, we trace his education from the yeshiva in Brighton Beach, uh, really to the best universities in the country, from Columbia to Harvard, uh, and faculty positions at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, onto the NIH for a really formative uh, period in his uh, scientific development, then ultimately to UCSD, and fortunately for us, then to UCSF. He became chair of the Department of Psychiatry in 1986, and uh, he quite honestly saw the future of the field. He was committed to building it here. Um, he set his sights on identifying and recruiting the very best young physician scientists in the country, making a bet on molecular biology and human genetics to provide key insights into the causes of psychiatric illness as the necessary step to develop uh, more effective treatments and to move towards cures. <laughs> I have to say, it's difficult for me to overstate as chair just how prescient this vision was. Um, it's as important today and vital today as it was 20 years ago. Uh, in fact, perhaps even more so given recent progress in the field, which uh, our second speaker is going to uh, tell you lots about. I have to say that it's, it, it feels both humbling um, and exciting in a way as the current chair of the Department of Psychiatry uh, to say that really the um, my major objective here as chair of psychiatry uh, since I arrived here four years ago was to execute on a vision uh, that Sam articulated nearly 20 years ago. So from the talks you're here today, uh, you will get a sense, I think, of some of Sam's uh, key scientific contributions uh, from some of the earliest studies and understanding the nature of learning and memory to understanding cell-cell interactions, um, <clears throat> contributing, as I said, really to the birth of the field of neuroscience. Um, I'd like to point out for you that, at least in my view, his lasting impact goes well beyond these remarkable and world-class scientific achievements, beyond his articles, his lectures, and the wonderful books that he's written. Um, as much as anything, um, I feel that um, uh, it's important for us to really recognize that he has advanced the field and had, I think, almost a measurable impact because of his eye for talent and his equally remarkable persuasiveness. The physician scientist that he managed to bring here, often with the most modest of means, uh, really reads now like a who's who in psychiatric neuroscience and genetics. John Rubenstein, Mark Von Zastro, Alison Dope, Larry Teacott, David Cox, Nelson Frymer, Rob Alenka, and Ruben has it, we were inches away from uh, a seducing doctor. Dice are up here to UCSF, <laughs> so you can't win them all. <laughs> Sam's recent picks are uh, no less uh, the superstars of their generation, Vika Sohal, Dave Manoli, Anna Malofsky. And I think most of you know that I would not be standing here today if not for the efforts of Sam uh, to get me to come and have a look at uh, the chair of the department position. I'd like to say in closing that I, I, it was not terribly surprising to me that when I asked Sam if there was anything in particular he'd like me to talk about today, um, that the one thing that he mentioned to me was his leadership of the art committee at UCSF. <laughs> He's had a hand not only in science, but in beautifying everything you see around us here um, in the campus, both here at Mission Bay and Parnassus. Uh, so beyond establishing a new scientific field, transforming contemporary psychiatry, spotting and nurturing the brain trust for several generations in our field, Sam has made um, an even more indelible mark, I think, on our community. He was a man who was ahead of his time, and he uh, paid a price for that here, um, both in the Department of Psychiatry um, and in the field. It was a field and a department that was not ready uh, for the vision that he articulated. As I say, now 20 years later, it appears to be. I certainly hope that it is. Um, 
but his contribution to UCSF psychiatry and neuroscience only increased um, when he stepped down as chair. Uh, I think that says pretty much everything that you need to know about him as a man. Uh, he's a mensch, he's a brilliant scientist, he's a generous uh, and gracious leader who's deeply committed every day to making the world around him better. It's a true honor and pleasure to be able to celebrate and recognize him today. Sam. That's pretty hard to follow. Thank you, dear. Uh, wow. Woohoo! I wish it were true. <laughs> anyway, okay. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, special thanks to Carl for being the inaugural lecturer. Uh, special thanks to my uh, dear friends Gene and Sandy Robertson, who've been uh, supporting me and encouraging me for all the 30 years I've been at UCSF. Uh, special thanks to my immediate family, um, my wife Luann Brizendine, who everybody here knows, uh, my daughters Elizabeth and Jessica, my stepson Whitney, and my uh, promising young grandson Asher. <laughs> Grandsons have to be promising. Okay. This lectureship is about the neuroscience and psychiatry and bringing them together. So I've been asked to tell you how I ended up uh, in these fields which were, at the time that I started, very far apart. It's of course hard to really know how any of us end up anywhere. So we cherry pick our stories and try to make sense out of them. And in the next 20 minutes, I'll Cherry picked some stories about my work in three places where I built a career between 1960, 1960 and 1969. And I'll say a bit about what happened over the next half century and about the University of California. To keep from rambling into Carl's precious time, which I could easily do, I'll stick closely to my written text. And in the stories and uh, uh, incidents that I'll recount, uh, I will <coughs> emphasize the role of accident and luck, although you will also see something of a sense of direction which continues today. Now, with the clip, oh yes. Okay. Uh, the first place I want to thank is the National Institutes of Health, which I joined as a fellow in 1960, as well as a captain in the U.S. Public Health Service to fulfill my required military service. I've been to college and medical school at Columbia, <coughs> done an internship at the Brigham in Boston, and became interested in the effects of hormones on mental illness. I didn't have any clear plans after that. I thought maybe I'd go into endocrinology or psychiatry, but nothing was really set. And then came a series of unexpected and very fortunate events. The first was my meeting with Gordon Tompkins, the inspiring person some of you remember, because Bill Rudder brought him here to UCSF a number of years later. Gordon was just getting started at the NIH then, and he was thinking about how hormones work. And when I told him I was interested in endocrinology, he immediately dropped his big idea on me, <laughs> that hormones work by turning specific genes on and off. That is, by regulating gene expression. That doesn't sound like a big deal now, but this was in 1960, just seven years after the double helix. And it was just being established that genes work by being transcribed into RNA and then translated into protein, and Gordon had taken it a step further. He believed that hormones work 
by changing the expression of particular genes and increasing the manufacture of specific proteins. Sounds trivial, was a big deal. And to me, this was revolutionary. And the good news was that Gordon was willing to take me, a total inexperienced novice, into his lab. But there was a catch, and an interesting catch, and a fortuitous catch. Gordon was planning to go to Paris on a sabbatical, so I couldn't work with him until he came back. And as a result, he arranged for me to learn the ropes of molecular biology from a new and untested guy he had just hired, whose name was Marshall Nirenberg. It's not a name that excites anybody right now, but you'll see that it should. Okay, Marshall had just started working on one of the great unsolved problems of biology. How did genes, whose information is written in the four bases, A, C, G, and T, get translated into the 20 amino acids that are used to make proteins? Put simply, what is the genetic code? We all take this for granted now. It's in the front of all the books, you know, the front inside cover where the periodic table is in the chemistry books, it's there now. But, at that time, it was a complete mystery. Then, just a few weeks after I joined his lab, lightning struck. Marshall discovered that he could use synthetic RNAs, RNAs made in a chemistry lab, to figure this out. And the breakthrough came with an RNA made exclusively of uridine, RNA's version of thymine. When Marshall added this long chain of uridines, called poly-U, to his re reaction mixture, a funny thing happened. The only amino acid that went into the protein that was made was phenylalanine. There was, of course, a lot of skepticism about this, and Gordon, amongst others, said, ah, can't be. But, in the end, the results seem to be saying that a string of three U's, U, 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 is the code for one phenylalanine, which it is. A simple and lucky experiment had pointed the way to a solution of the whole genetic code. It's amazing. And I found myself, me, I was there, a novice, at the right place at the right time. And this is not such a bad thing. Wow, what a start in lab science. More good luck follow. While Marshall and his postdoc, Heinrich Maté, tested other synthetic RNAs to learn more about the code, I, the novice, was given my own project. This was in 1960 when this, these things happened. <laughs> so, see, so see, Sam, if you can, that you can find evidence that poly U is really working as a messenger RNA. Which, to my great good fortune, I did. Which quickly resulted in my publication with Marshall of two papers back to back in Science Magazine, a measure of their significance at the time which in turn contributed its small part to the deciphering of the code and made me a member of what the newspapers were calling the Code of Life Team, <laughs> for which Marshall won the Nobel Prize in 1968, seven years from obscurity to Stockholm and the Nobel Prize. And what a lucky break for me, who less than two years earlier had never even heard of molecular biology. And what great confidence this gave me to do lab research, because science works. It really works. But even though I had done this notable work, I didn't see myself becoming a full-time molecular biologist. And after spending the last time of my fellowship in Gordon's lab, when he got back, I chose a different path. 
I would apply my new skills to psychiatry and mental processes instead of endocrinology. A leap of faith. A leap of faith. All I needed was a flexible psychiatry training program that allowed me to continue my research. Fortunately, McLean Hospital and Harvard Medical School agreed to take me on. And once again, I was a beneficiary of the National Institutes of Health. This time it was by way of a special residency and fellowship which provided a very nice annual stipend of $12,000 per year, which also made it possible per year, per year, not per month, per year, <laughs> which also made it possible for me to marry, rent a little apartment in Harvard Square. And so in July of 1963, I moved from uh, NIH to Cambridge. Once there, I began looking for a mental process I could study which might depend on gene expression. And I would follow Gordon Tompkins by using a drug called puramycin. Puramycin blocks a critical step in the synthesis of proteins, and Gordon used it to block the effects of hormones on gene expression. So the same should also be true of a mental process if the mental process was also dependent on gene expression. If that was the case, it too should be blocked by puramycin or by other drugs that block protein synthesis, which is, you'll see turned out to be the case. But which mental process? The one that came to mind was memory storage. When we store a memory in our brain, it might depend on the synthesis of specific proteins in specific neurons. And if that's the case, it should be blocked by puramycin. And fortunately, there's a simple way to study this in mice. If you put a mouse in the lighted room, Well, it's the lighted room, the one with the light underneath. <laughs> it quickly goes through the door into the more welcoming dark chamber, which is not very dark on this slide, but it's the one on the right. Okay. And mice like to go into the dark, so if you put the mouse in the lighted room, it scoots right into the dark. But when if the mouse goes in and gets a little electric shock soon as it goes into the chamber, it immediately runs back into the lighted room. And if you test this mouse by putting it back into the light room at one time, say an hour or three hours or six hours or a day or a week after that first terrible experience, it doesn't go back into the dark room. It remembers that it's bad in there, and it stays out. Okay, so it's a simple one-trial learning. It's a very easy experiment to do. So what happens if you train a mouse who can't make new proteins because of pure mycin? I and Hirsch Cohen, a psychology graduate student who joined me when I was a resident at McLean, did those experiments. And here is a simple version of the results. If you test the pyromycin treated mouse at one hour after training, it doesn't go in. It stays out of the dark. It remembers. If you test another one of these guys at three hours after training, it doesn't go in. It remembers. But if you take a mouse that was trained under the influence of pyromycin, and test him six hours after training, he goes in. He forgot, doesn't remember anymore. Or a day or a week or whatever. He is amnesic. He remembers just fine for three hours, but if you wait for six or more hours and test the pyramids and treated mouse, it's forgotten. 
The memory which had been established in some form at the beginning is gone forever. So the upshot is that brain protein synthesis is not required to keep short-term memory, which means memory, in this case, for up to about three hours after memory. But brain protein synthesis appears to be indispensable for long-term memory. Memory for six or more hours after learning. And this was big news at the time. And it was documented by us in a stream of papers in Nature and Science, which also used other tasks and other inhibitors of protein synthesis, such as acetoxycycloexamide. The answer was all the same. And it supported my belief that psychology and psychiatry had much to learn from molecular biology. Yeah, yeah, those were the days. Uh, after completing my training at McLean, I took my first faculty job in the Department of Psychiatry at the brand new Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I was drawn there by its booming interdepartmental neuroscience program, a novelty at the time, and New York was the home to all four of the grandparents. Since I heard a little bit of emotional reaction, I'd like to point out something else about that slide which justified my showing. I want you to notice, oops, oops, I, I went the wrong way. I want you to notice in the background, there are those rectangular things which are tiles. Okay. Why are there tiles in the background? Well, when I moved to the Department of Psychiatry at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, the Department of Psychiatry, this was in 1966, they didn't have any labs. But the Department of Psychiatry at Albert Einstein College of Medicine was very rich in men's rooms. <laughs> <laughs> and so, as you, as you will see, my lab, where much great work was done, was conducted in a reconditioned men's room. <laughs> and, and some of you who know about my life at UCSF know that it was recapitulated but at a higher level with kitchens and things like that. <laughs> so in this lab, uh, made out of the men's room, we continued filling in the memory story and we added a new dimension to this research by addressing two general questions about protein metabolism in the brain. The first question was related to the extreme asymmetry of neurons, which have long extensions called axons. Since proteins tend to be made near the nucleus, where the genes and the DNA and the RNA are, they have to be shipped long distances to nerve endings and synapses. So how quickly does this happen? The second question was related to the fact that unlike most cells, which are continually dying and being replaced, most neurons are made in fetal life and need to last your whole lifetime. This led to the belief that structural pro the belief at that time that structural proteins in neurons might be unusually stable to maintain the network of connections. But is that true? Uh, to make a long story short, the answer to the first question is that most axons in the brain are short enough to permit proteins to reach their nerve endings very quickly. And the answer to the second is that brain proteins, including microtubule proteins, are continuously being degraded and regenerated with turnovers in the range of days. So the big answer that came from these studies, and which is now common knowledge, is that brain structure is unexpectedly plastic. The components of your neurons, their nerve endings, their synapses, are changing all the time. This is big news at the time. So in 1968, the International Society for Cell Biology devoted its annual meeting in Paris to the issues I just described. And I was asked to give a paper and edit the proceedings. 
The first paragraph of the preface I wrote, now yellow with age, sums up a new view, one that has radically changed, that had radically changed over just a few years. That neural, cellular, and molecular composition is under constant regulation, and that brain function should be analyzed, and not only through its electrical signals, but also with the tools of molecular biology. Having been commissioned to put this volume together was to me the clearest evidence that I had arrived as a member of the still tiny neuroscience community. I had started in 1960 with no clear direction and with no research experience. By 1969, I had come of age. And since I was also always deeply engaged with psychiatry, I could now join a handful of people who were becoming eager to try to build these two fields together. And then came a call from the University of California. Arnold Mandel, the founding chair of psychiatry at the brand new UCSD Medical School in La Jolla, wanted to recruit me as his first faculty member. And after several visits to this exciting new place and the neighboring Salk Institute, which was already there in its magnificent presence, I managed to persuade Arnold to make me an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> a full professorship with tenure and a leadership role in founding the brand new interdepartmental neuroscience program. But to that, that, my hope then was that the advances of the 60s would soon, and I really believed soon, make a difference for mental disorders. And my optimism was understandable. In Marshall's lab, I had witnessed firsthand the Nobel Prize winning solution of one of the mysteries of biology, the genetic code. Science works. As a resident in psychiatry with just one graduate student, I had made contributions to the molecular basis of memory storage. Science works. In a few years at Einstein, I helped clear up some important issues about protein dynamics in the brain. Science works. So it seemed reasonable to believe that as the tide of brain research kept rising, it would bring significant advances, not only in basic science, but also in our understanding and treatment of schizophrenia, depression, and other mental illnesses a view that kept growing as I moved on from UCSD to UCSF. And this optimism got a bigger boost as human genetics exploded in the 80s and 90s and kept becoming more and more applicable to mental disorders, which I personally observed as an early consultant to Nancy Wexler and the Huntington's Disease Foundation, which led to the discovery of the gene and a lot of other interesting phenomena. So, to spread the news about molecular psychiatry and psychiatric genetics, I began writing books. The first, Molecules in Mental Illness, was commissioned by Scientific American Library to explain the approach I've just described to the general public. It was followed by mood genes, which summed up the history and prospects of psychiatric genetics, using as an example studies of bipolar disorder, which were being conducted by and which I was involved in at UCSF. Then came Baird and Prozac, which described the potential implications of genetic discoveries for psychiatric drug development. Now it is becoming clear that a great deal of attention must also be paid to details of complex brain circuitry. And the good news, as you will hear from Carl, is that the tools to tackle 
this challenging problem, keep improving at an astonishing pace. So, to conclude, I'm deeply honored. Okay. So, to conclude, I am deeply honored that this lectureship is being set up in my name. It's my hope that from year to year we'll keep chronicling the advances that we will depend on to address the still daunting problems of mental illness. It's my hope that it will be an annual opportunity for the UCSF community to take clear note of and to celebrate inspiring and practical achievements in the field. And I thank you all for joining me as we get started today. Thank you very much.